Hello and welcome to the monthly Megabyte CEO Barometer. For those of you who don't know Megabyte, we're a research firm and we track the financial performance, corporate activity and strategic positioning of the UK's leading technology and digital firms and we provide an international context as well to those, those key UK trends. The idea of this show each month is that I pull together some of the key themes and trends that we've seen across uh, the sector over the last month and try and um, work out what that means in terms of uh, looking forward towards the, the outlook. It's been another very, very busy month on the Megabyte research team. The guys have analysed over 160 company results, trading updates and uh, corporate transactions, looking at the, the data and writing about the key themes within those, those deals and also had around 50 management conversations with companies that we track that have resulted in research and analysis on the likes of Civica, Six Degrees, ANS, Content and Cloud, um, ActiveOps, Coins, Invenio, and many other businesses that we track. All of this research and data is available to our subscribers, um, and uh, we currently have about 200, over 200 uh, subscribers across corporate technology companies, investors and advisors. If you think that uh, the research that we do may be of interest to you, um, what I'd suggest is you go to our website at megabyte.com and hit the request a demo button at the top of the screen and our customer team will be very happy to help you. Over the next 20 minutes or so, I will be covering, as I do each month, capital markets, M&A um, and private equity activity, trying to understand what the key themes and trends are in those areas, as well as what's happening with valuations. Um, but before I dive into those in more detail, just to give you a quick overview of uh, the key takeaways for this month. <clears throat> uh, on, the capital market, it was, on the capital markets, it was a strong month uh, again in February. Um, both in the UK and the US, the technology sectors were both strong, um, as well as the broader market. So a positive theme in, in, in overall in the capital market. A couple of key points to, to note. One, we're seeing increased volatility in share prices, primarily around uh, worries about inflation coming through. And I'll touch on why that's important, particularly for the technology sector. And also, of course, it's a, it's a uh, you know, that the IPO market continues to be a strong theme in the US and increasingly in the UK. And the wave of digital IPOs that we've been talking about coming is starting. We're starting to see more evidence of that coming through with ATG and Trustpilot in, in February. And I'll touch on some of the key themes around that, as well, of course, uh, as uh, the uh, SPAC, special purpose acquisition companies from the US. And that theme just gets bigger and bigger and more important and increasingly important in the European context as well. And I'll touch on why I think that's the case. Overall, in terms of deal activity uh, in the UK, it was a pretty quiet month, actually. Um, we only, record, only recorded 50 transactions um, on our database uh, during February. That was down from 69 in, uh, in February 2020, obviously just as we were going into the, into the pandemic. M&A was broadly flat with 30 transactions, down from 33 last year. Uh, the real weakness was it was private equity, only uh, only 19 transactions there compared to 33 uh, in the preceding uh, month in the month uh, in February 2020. The big change there is really around growth capital, and I'll touch on why I think uh, wh why that is and some of the key deals. Candidly, I don't I really don't think that uh, there's anything to read into that. That you know it's just a, a natural ebb and flow of deal flow. Um, but I'll talk on some of the key themes around around that as well. Very quiet month in capital markets for secondary offerings. Uh, again this month as it was in January, um, but there's quite a lot happening in terms of IPO activity, which I said, and I'll, I'll touch on that. So I'll go through those in order, capital markets, followed by, uh, followed by uh, private equity and ending up on looking at M&A in a bit more detail. So first of all, I'll uh, drill into a bit more detail on capital markets. So as I mentioned at the top of the show, it was a pretty positive month in February for uh, capital markets, both in terms of the technology sector on both sides of the Atlantic, uh, and also the broader the broader market. So just to drill into some of the numbers around that, uh, the UK technology sector, which we measure as uh, the Megabyte Universe Index of about 100 UK listed technology and digital companies, uh, that index overall was up 2.7% in February. Um, with interestingly, um, ICT services uh, once again performing better than software. ICT services was up about were up about on average 3%, whereas the software was up 1.8%. In terms of what that means for valuations, the, uh, the overall UK uh, technology sector was trading at about 19 times current year EV EBITDA, uh, just below that level uh, at the end of February. Um, the software sector at about 23 and a half times and the ICT services sector at just under 15 times. All of those numbers up very slightly in February. 
Um, in terms of the context around that, uh, the FTSE 250, which is a good measure of the broader kind of UK focused uh, company performance, that was up 3.4% in February, so a very strong performance from the wider market. And the NASDAQ, the tech heavy NASDAQ in the US, actually up only 0.9% in February. So the UK tech sector outperforming the US tech sector uh, for a change. And the valuation uh, of the NASDAQ currently is running at about 23.7 times according to Cap IQ. Um, uh, and actually that was down slightly in, um, in February. So although share prices are rising, valuation uh, actually down slightly suggesting that overall EBITDA estimates were rising uh, faster than share prices for that month at least. So positive month overall for capital markets. Three kind of areas I want to just to drill into in a little bit more detail around capital markets. First one is around this idea of volatility and why in, uh, volatility driven by concerns about inflation matters so much for the technology sector. So what we saw in February was um, a period where uh, markets were getting the jitters about increased inflation as a result of uh, the potential for a rapid bounce back in economic, economic activity following the pandemic. And uh, uh, why is this important for uh, the technology sector? Why is it important for the markets generally, but particularly the technology sector? If inflation rises, uh, typically that means the uh, central banks respond with increased, increased interest rates. That therefore generally means that funds flow out of equity markets and into bond markets because the returns improve in bond markets. And that, that therefore puts downward pressure on equity markets. So that's why we see uh, volatility and negative uh, sentiment around markets when uh, in, a, in a rising interest rate environment. So the market's doing what it always does and looking ahead and thinking about what might happen over the next 12 months. So that's, gonna, that's a bit of a concern for the market and might dampen um, enthusiasm a little bit for equity markets. But it's particularly important for the technology sector because... Uh, what we've seen over the last 10 years as interest rates have been um, at historically low levels is increasingly people are looking for returns elsewhere and um, the, the systemic uh, structural growth, in, te growth in, technolo in the technology sector provides a great way of driving returns in a low interest rate environment and that's been turbocharging uh, investment um, patterns in the technology sector really for the last decade. So what you have is if we do have a period where um, um, increased uh, worries about inflation increases volatility and then you do get a period of inflation where interest and interest rates rising, that is likely to have a disproportionately negative impact on the technology sector. Now, from my perspective, all of that is entirely manageable. Uh, the, st the structural growth trends in technology sector are so strong. And as we talk about every month on this show, pretty much, and in our research, uh, they just get stronger and they are stronger post-COVID than they were previously. So I'm not concerned about that with inflation at manageable, normal levels returning to whatever, it, you know, 2 or 3%. Um, over the next uh, over the next uh, few months, the danger comes when we uh, if we see re inflation really running out of control and central banks are required to raise rates really very rapidly, uh, that could s spell serious uh, trouble for investment patterns in the technology sector. Uh, so we're keeping a uh, keeping a close eye on, on that. Secondly, I promise to talk a bit more about the IPO market and in particular the digital digital IPOs that we're seeing uh, and that trend in the UK. Two key data points really uh, for, for, for you on, on that this month. Uh, the, the impending IPOs of ATG, uh, which is a uh, used to be Antiques Trade Gazette, I think. So not one for now, but a really phenomenal sort of analog to digital story over the last decade, uh, that business. That is coming to the market at a, a room at 600 million. I think that's confirmed now, 600 million valuation. And just last week, Trustpilot, uh, Danish business, but, but, but listing in London, talking about a billion pound uh, valuation for that business. So two kind of, um, you know, clear digital businesses, important data points on that trend towards, uh, towards increasing numbers of digital IPOs that I've talked about for a few months now on the show. Uh, what the outlook for, what's the outlook for that as we go forward? I don't see any fundamental change at the moment, but I'm going to talk about SPACs in a minute, special purpose acquisition companies, and what's happening there may have an impact on, on our view on, uh, on the coming digital IPOs, but I'll come back to that. Before I do that, I wanted just to touch quickly on Darktrace, the mega IPO that, that is planned and has been long talked about for London. Uh, uh, um, cybersecurity business, very high growth, uh, a very exciting business, but one that has courted, not courted, but has, has been slightly controversial because Mike Lynch of Autonomy, uh, uh, formerly of Autonomy that you will all know, 
uh, his uh, private equity, his venture capital vehicle, Invoke Capital, backed that. And there's a number of senior, uh, a number of a significant number of the senior uh, members of the team at, at Dark Trace are ex-autonomy. So, so there's that connection there, which is not particularly helpful at the moment, particularly during Mike Lynch's extradition uh, trial, which is ongoing. Uh, and there's been lots of rumours in the press, which I'm not going to repeat in any detail about advisors uh, not wanting to be involved because of the connections. It's all rumours, and, and I don't want to go into any of that, uh, that here. The thing for me that I thought was interesting um, about that was that last week the company appointed um, a new chairman and a, a non-exec. That strongly suggests to me that the IPO is moving ahead, albeit maybe a bit more slowly than we thought. And uh, that, uh, that is, uh, you know, good news. And I think we'll, we'll probably see, still expect to see Dark Trace arriving on the London market um, at some point this year, probably in the first half, I guess. Uh, and there are other IPOs coming forward that we know, both in terms of software, but mainly in digital. We still think that private equity land is where most of the kind of traditional SaaS software, B2B software businesses that we're so good at producing in the UK will remain. Um, so I won't repeat my thinking around that, but that's a, an ongoing theme that we think will continue. Um, Dark Trace, I don't think, is one of those businesses that are likely to be uh, acquired by a SPAC because of its difficulty with the US connection, but who knows, but I think that's unlikely. But to, just to thirdly, just to talk about that SPAC trend, so special purpose, special purpose acquisition companies, these are shell companies listed on NASDAQ typically in the US uh, that raise money, uh, a, small amount, a smallish amount of money or a smaller amount of money uh, to fund their activities to go and find a business to acquire, then they de -SPAC and that business effectively becomes the listed entity. So it's kind of a reverse takeover as we call it here, a slow motion reverse takeover. Extremely popular in the US at the moment. There are 174 SPACs listed just in February and raising $56 billion just in February in the US and they're on track to do more SPACs and raise more money in the first quarter of 20, 2021 than in the whole of 2020. So that's a, just a huge phenomenon. It is a, proving to be a very popular way of, of investors parking money in the markets and waiting for uh, acquisitions to come along. What does it mean for us here in Europe? Well, it's quite clear that um, a lot of these SPACs are looking at the European technology sector as uh, a way of deploying capital. We saw the PaySafe $9 billion deal, pound deal, uh, before Christmas. That was a SPAC acquiring PaySafe. And there's been chatter about Kazoo and uh, Babylon Health and others late stage venture capital uh, businesses being acquired potentially by SPACs. Why does this matter in the context of the UK IPO market? Well, I think it matters because I think there is the potential for some of the businesses that might list in London, uh, the digital businesses that we're talking about, to actually end up being acquired by SPACs. And that ultimately means they, they list in, in the US. It might not be a standard US listing, uh, but uh, it's still a listing and, and it's not in London. So. Candidly, I think that SPACs represent something of an existential threat to the tech sector um, IPO pipeline in the London market, particularly at the larger end. Uh, and uh, you, I note the Hill report that was, uh, that was published, I think, this morning uh, or this week, talking about um, how the London market might change uh, to encourage more SPAC-type vehicles in London. That can't happen quickly enough, as far as I'm concerned, although I register concerns from some institutional investors about a, uh, a, a, a reduction in, in uh, corporate governance standards. But, you know, we've got to work this out, I think. Otherwise, uh, I think London is going to fall further behind in the tech IPO kind of world. So a concern, I have to say there. So that's a quick uh, walk through the capital markets. I'm going to talk next uh, about uh, private equity and venture capital. So to move on now to talk about um, private capital, both in terms of mid-market private equity and also early stage venture capital growth capital deals. Um, as I said at the top of the show, it was a relatively quiet period for, um, for, for private equity and venture capital, particularly in the venture capital side of things. Um, I don't ascribe any particular um, uh, concern to that in the sense of worrying that there's a, an underlying trend of reduction in activity. I think it's just a, it's just, it is a quite a volatile, can be quite a volatile data series. And, uh, and I think the underlying themes within all parts of the private capital market are still strong. So to look first at mid-market private equity, we registered four deals uh, on our database during February. That was down from seven in February uh, 2020. Uh, January was very strong. So overall, we're seeing uh, broadly kind of flat numbers of deals uh, in, in the mid-market private equity space. And as is the case across um, venture capital and private equity, much a, a very strong flavor of software this month. Um, 
it, 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 you know, in total, as I said at the top of the show, we registered 19 deals and um, all but two of those uh, in February were in the software sector. So just to pick out a couple of key uh, deals to talk about quickly and, and, and some interesting takeaways on valuation with those. So two reasonably chunky software deals at Keeler Hayward, which is in the, uh, which is a pension administration software business primarily to uh, local, uh, local and central government. That was a, what we think was a 350 million enterprise value deal from BlackRock, which is interesting, not a name that we've uh, seen a lot of in mid-market private equity in the UK. So that's interesting to see them uh, getting involved. We don't have a, we don't have a, that's an deal estimate. Um, based on that value, it would be about a mid-teens um, trailing EV EBITDA multiple. And I'll talk about why I think that's a relatively low multiple compared to some of the other deals we've seen um, uh, in, the, in recent months uh, in a second. The second larger, uh, actually a secondary buyout we saw, second sort of decent sized transaction we saw in February was System C Healthcare. This is a, uh, a primary care software business that's been um, operating in the UK for a long time. I remember following System C when it was a, a listed company back in the day when I was an analyst in the city and it uh, was taken private and it's, it's currently owned or was until uh, this week owned by System C, by, sorry, by Symphony Technology uh, Partners. And uh, that was sold to CVC for what we think was around 215 million enterprise value. Again, that's an estimate. Again, we think it was around uh, mid-teens um, EV, EBITDA on, EV EBITDA on a trailing basis. So, so why are we seeing these two businesses, really quality, high quality software businesses trading at uh, changing hands at what we think was, was perhaps slightly lower multiples than, uh, than some of the other software deals we're seeing at the moment. Some of you will hear, have heard me talk about another other, other analyst at Mega, Megabyte talking about 30 is the new 20, and this is the idea that software uh, businesses are now starting to trade um, quite often well above 20 times um, EV EBITDA, and so in some cases are beyond that, both in a private equity context and also in a quoted company context. And we're certainly seeing uh, quite a lot of that why not with these two businesses then? Well, although we are seeing genuine, genuine uh, valuation inflation, it doesn't mean that the, 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 the laws of investment are completely, uh, have completely changed. And both businesses are uh, operating in relatively restricted uh, uh, markets, UK healthcare in one case, UK uh, local government, central government in the other. And that limited TAM, albeit a big TAM, but limited geographically and by vertical market limits growth clearly over the medium to long term. And that is clearly, and it has an impact on valuation. It's also quite a high level of uh, customer concentration with both of those businesses. So those things, have, we believe probably, again, it's an estimate, um, have meant that the valuations are strong, but not perhaps as strong as some of the other businesses we've seen in the market. So that's key takeaway from those deals. And moving on to growth capital, I think that, uh, you know, again, just to reiterate that the lower deal volumes, 15 deals, 15 growth capital deals in February compared to 25 in, uh, in February 2020 um, is nothing particularly to read into that. Just to talk briefly about the key themes we're seeing there, uh, kind of three things I'd bring out. One is just this re re theme we talk about a lot. I talk about a lot in this show is about data, data, data. Chapter two, the chapter two of the cloud era um, and the next generation of software businesses will be, a lot of them will be data focused rather than, uh, rather than process focused. And we're seeing that with the likes of Matillion, which is a cloud data integration, a hundred million dollar raise from battery and others. Um, Solidatus, uh, Series A led by Albion and, and others around, particularly focused on the financial services market, corporate data management, and Peak, a Series B led by Ox, NMC and others uh, also in, this, in that data space. So we're seeing a regular flow of deals in enterprise software and other areas of the market, financial services focused on data. Also enterprise, I talk, I've talked a lot over the last few months about enterprise software being a big driver in the M&A segment, but actually it's also a big driver in the growth capital segment. And what we're particularly seeing is venture capital and growth investors looking at the next generation of enterprise software businesses. And a couple of, um, a couple of kind of examples I thought were really interesting in February. One was um, Otco, which is in the, which is a sort of, um, shift worker and a, a kind of early pay uh, platform for uh, in the HGM space and that was a 29, 29 million part equity part debt raise and also uh, Limitless which is a really interesting where well, they call themselves a, uh, a gig CX platform this is where uh, companies can engage with the platform to hire call center workers on a gig economy basis and the platform manages output and quality and all those sorts of things. Really interesting concept uh, and that was, a, that was a, 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 um, a 7 million raise led by Albion and others. Uh, 
So as ever, the VC community looking at that next stage of E2B enterprise software rather than investing in, in the kind of the, the, the sort of more established players as you'd expect. Thirdly, just to touch on, there was a couple of interesting ICT deals in there um, amongst all the software deals. The one I'd pick out is Easy, I think that's how you pronounce it, uh, M2M, uh, M2M Connectivity Business, that was a 15 million ra ra raise. And uh, that's just another data point on the quite interesting journey for uh, M2M and uh, M2M Connectivity, which is obviously a, a very significant chapter two driver that we'll see going forward. Candidly, we haven't seen a lot of independent businesses get it. I mean, obviously wireless logic in the mid-market space is the exception that proves the rule to a degree. A lot of M2M connectivity activity is going on within the larger telcos and other larger corporates. But Easy was an interesting, uh, interesting data point on uh, another trend around, uh, around um, M2M connectivity, which obviously connects into the 5G, uh, the 5G trend, which um, we'll see more of a lot over the next few years. So, so um, interesting deal flow within growth capital, if not the largest volume of deals in February. So that's a quick canter through what we've seen in private capital and private markets in February. And I'm now going to go on to talk about some of the key themes and trends and deals within uh, M&A. So last but very very definitely not least to uh, to look at some of the key themes trends around uh, M&A activity and valuations uh, over the last month and you know it was a steady month for M&A activity in the UK tech sector as I mentioned earlier 30 deals we recorded in the month against 33 in February 2020 so broadly flat and we're seeing M&A in that kind of in that kind of pattern at the moment as with private equity and growth capital, there was more of an emphasis on software deals in February with 19 of those deals in software and 11 of them in ICT services. But actually some of the key themes and trends within, uh, within the M&A are, are very prevalent uh, in, in ICT uh, services. So I'm gonna start uh, talking about that. First of all, in IT consulting. So um, uh, those of you who listened to the show last month will have heard me talking about increasing amounts of buy and build activity in IT consulting uh, in the UK market. And actually we've seen IT consulting become even more of a kind of M&A hotspot during February with three significant uh, deals. Uh, two of those with uh, Accenture acquiring uh, significant players in the UK market. So that was interesting in itself. Um, but very different uh, businesses they're acquiring. So on the first, these two deals one day apart, they acquired Eden House and Infinity Works. Eden House is an ECI backed significant player in the UK SAP market. We think that deal was done at about 130 million sterling uh, at about probably uh, four times sales. Quite a high EV EBITDA multiple, we think about 27 times trailing. That reflects some difficulties that uh, Eden House has been having as it restructures its business to reflect some of the significant changes in the SAP market over the last few years that has dampened margins. Um, and it looks like Accenture to a degree has looked through some of those, uh, that, that sort of short term impact on Eden House. And, um, but it you know, has been a business that has been um, struggling somewhat uh, over the last few years and um, you know, interesting to see Accenture coming in to uh, take it off ECI's hands at what we think was just only a little bit higher than ECI paid for it a few years ago. Infinity Works, very different story. One of the highest growth, if not the highest growth, uh, digital transformation IT consulting businesses we, of any size we track at Megabyte. Again, acquired by Accenture, we think about 220 million, 23 times trailing EBITDA, probably more like a mid-teens to high-teens EV EBITDA multiple on a current year basis because that business is growing at 40-50% a year, probably a bit slower in 2020 because of COVID, but still structurally a very strong growth business. Great result for growth capital partners. And the third significant deal there really, Invenio, um, Invenio UK-based SAP consulting business, uh, primarily focused on public sector, acquiring a similar looking business, LSI in the States, for what we think was around 11 times EBITDA. So there's a range of, there's a range of valuations there, but we think that there are good reasons around that, that kind of range. The outlook, I think, for IT consulting M&A remains very strong. It is just one of the structural growth, you know, digital transformation. IT consulting around digital transformation is just one of the uh, sort of epicenters of structural growth in the sector at the moment, and that is inevitably going to draw in investor attention and consolidation attention and trade buyer attention. So we expect that trend to continue going forward. Um, also in ICT services, continuing M&A activity in telecom services and um, uh, OneCom acquiring Olive and uh, Focus uh, acquiring Southwest Comms, classic. 
uh, you know, t telecom services consolidation de deals. But content and cloud acquiring SIPCOM, we think, was a really interesting convergence deal. Uh, you know, it's convergence in uh, of IT and uh, telecoms and IT services accelerating in a post-COVID world as a result of uh, the, you know, m m in this case, particularly around Microsoft entering and accelerating its development in comms around Teams and other uh, initiatives. And so really interesting to see M&A activity around, around that in the UK market. So lots going on in ICT services, even though the deal flow was slightly lower relative to software. In software, uh, really the main theme again is enterprise. I mean, there's been a number of deals across different peer groups, but enterprise continues to be a strong theme, as I've talked about um, multiple times on this show over the last few months. Uh, it's actually, interestingly, the, 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 most of the kind of really volume players, Access, Iris, Civica in the private equity world, did not, did not announce any deals in February, although Civica's just announced one this morning, so they're still at it. Uh, but uh, Learning Technologies Group, London listed businesses closing or announcing two acquisitions in, uh, in February. And, and the biggest deal was uh, Brandwatch being acquired by Cision. That was a um, that was a 300 plus million pound deal uh, in 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 the sort of digital communications, digital consumer intelligence space, a platform for digital consumer intelligence. Um, and uh, so so just continuing M and A activity uh, in the enterprise software space, uh, as well as as I said earlier in in the uh, in the private equity and particularly in the growth capital space during February. Just before I wrap up, just to talk about, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of chatter about a bubble. I've talked a bit about about it. Not, nothing I've really talked about over the last 20 minutes or so has really gave, given you a significant indication of bubble territory. Valuations seem pretty stable, um, although, you know, pushing up a bit. But to give you a, a little bubble data point for you, CrowdStrike's acquisition of Humio in, the, uh, in February in the cybersecurity space, we think CrowdStrike paid $4 million per employee for that business. So that seems like quite a lot and about 40 times revenue. But it's okay because CrowdStrike's trading on 60 times revenue. So it's accretive. So it's great. Um, so that's kind of interesting. So um, that was kind of the main theme, of, uh, the, 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 the sort of look at the main areas of activity during February. In terms of the outlook, notwithstanding what I said earlier, said earlier on about SPACs potentially robbing the London market of some of the digital IPO flow I've been talking about, which we're watching carefully, um, and also the inflation uh, volatility point having an impact overall on markets, which again we're watching carefully, nothing's fundamentally changed in our outlook. Positive outlook for deal flow and valuations through 2021. Um, and nothing has fundamentally um, altered in that during February. Um, so just before I wrap up, I wanted just to mention a couple of, of, of other uh, elements uh, uh, that I have talked about on our CEO hub uh, during uh, February and I'm going to be talking about over in March. Last month I talked about uh, um, some concerns I have around uh, pro particularly private equity backed businesses using M&A to fill um, to, to, to fill. Uh, uh, EBITDA holes, if you like, you, you know, acquiring a business and then buying an EBITDA to create a certain size and then selling it on. And, and that seems to be more and more part of the private equity playbook. And I published a more detailed thinking around that on our CEO hub, CEO hub during February. So please go and take a look at that at megabyte.com. That's a free to air part of the site. So you don't need, need to be a subscriber to, to read that. I'm going to switch it up a little bit for my CEO hub posts over the next few months to switch away from uh, corporate activity uh, themes onto more strategy themes. And I spent a lot of time last year in, in, in when the COVID stuff was all at, at red hot, uh, talking about, thinking about what this all meant for the long-term vision, our long-term view on the generational shift and the use of enterprise technology. What I'm going to do over the next few months is think about, bring it all a bit more short-term and think about what are the what what might be the really the, the, the key growth drivers and key areas of growth for tech and digital businesses, um, with 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 um, with the, our minds on the accelerated digital transformation over the next couple of years. So keep an eye out for those, and I'll mention those again next month. So that was a quick canter through. I hope you found that useful. Thank you very much for joining me again this month. Um, please stay safe, and thanks for listening. <laughs>